Yeah, we can start. Yeah, sure. Okay, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, to the IFC Bulgarian Turkish workshop on bridge maintenance. And today, our first speaker is Ivanov Stoyan, and uh, he, he's um, a chief assistant professor uh, at University of Architecture, Civil Engineering, and Geodesy. Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, till September 2010. And now he's the managing director for Schmetta Consultant uh, for the last almost 10 years. And uh, the IFC Bulgaria has been formed uh, in the recent years. And uh, thanks for all your efforts and support. And I'll just uh, give the uh, microphone to you, Stoyan, thanks. Okay, thank you all. I would also like to, before we start, to thank to our host, uh, the Turkish group of IAPSE, for the initiative and organizing this workshop. And special thanks to the chairman, Alp, and uh, Mustafa for the organization. Uh, I would also like to welcome everyone who has chosen to be here today uh, to attend this seminar. And I hope that you will find uh, our presentations interesting and maybe they will also provoke some fruitful discussion. So I'll share my screen. The first uh, presentation uh, will be about uh, the findings of visual inspection done for free steel concrete composite bridges in Bulgaria. The contents of the presentation is as follows. So I'll give you a short introduction about the composite bridges in general in Bulgaria. Then we'll switch to the three examples or the three bridges that we have done the visual inspections. There are two road bridges and one uh, railway bridge. And in the end, I will do some summary and conclusions from uh, the presentation and the findings. So first of all, uh, as you all know, the main clients to bridge construction are the national railway and road administrations in each country, as in Bulgaria, uh, followed by the municipalities. And in some rare cases, we have uh, private or other initiatives for bridge design and construction. Uh, looking uh, to the map of the railway infrastructure in our country, uh, you can see the it consists of around 4,000 uh, kilometers of railway lines with standard gauge uh, and with around uh, 1,000 railway bridges. But uh, if you look how these bridges are divided into the material used, so 74% uh, are concrete bridges, around 25 to 26% are steel bridges, and actually just a few, uh, we have just a few composite bridges as the percentage of the composite bridges fall below 0.5 uh, in reality. To look at uh, the map of the national road network, uh, it's uh, 20,000 kilometers that uh, do not include the rural roads and municipality roads. And we here we have, uh, 3,600 bridges in total. Uh, I do not have the official data for how many of these bridges are exactly composite bridges, but uh, due to my own observation, uh, I believe the percentage of the composite bridges on our road network is also falling below 0 0.5 from the total amount of the bridges. For sure, all of you know that uh, rainfall Rainforest concrete comprise about two-thirds to entire bridge stock for many EU countries. 
but uh, still the percentage of composite bridges in Bulgaria can be considered as uh, very low. So there is a chance to increase several times uh, and uh, to promote these structures with uh, their advantages. Uh, here in this table, I have tried to summarize uh, 10 of the major composite bridges in Bulgaria with uh, some data for them. As you can see, this is the type of traffic, the statical scheme used, the year of completion, etc. I will just uh, want to mention, looking to the year of, com of completion, that uh, maybe we can say we have two periods of design and building uh, composite bridges before the 1989, when the regime changes. We have only three or four major structures, at, at least to my knowledge, uh, built. After that, there is uh, one period of around 15 years where new significant bridges of that kind were not built, uh, mainly due to economical reasons, which were a consequence of the change of the political regime in the country. And then uh, around uh, 2006, 2007, we have again some renewal and design of some new structures. Uh, where, as you can see, in the year 2010, the first uh, two continuous girder bridges are built. Another thing that you can recognize from the data in the table is how uh, the general type of composite bridge, what is the general type of composite bridge in Bulgaria. As you can see from the data, it's a girder bridge uh, with a predominantly simply supported span uh, in the range of 35, 45 meter, there is only one single uh, bridge that is uh, with a span of 64 meter. This is for the metro in uh, in Sofia truss girder that differs the typical composite bridges in, in uh, Bulgaria. From these ten bridges, we have done a visual inspection on one bridge from the, let's say, first period. Uh, this is uh, built in 1974. And the two bridges that are continuous girder built in 2010 are in the focus of uh, this presentation. Starting with the older structure, the bridge is actually situated near the capital, Sofia, in the western part of the country. Uh, in a residential park of the government. Uh, this bridge is over a small river uh, connecting uh, a road that is connecting the two main buildings in this uh, residential uh, park. This is a general view of the bridge. Uh, as I already said, is uh, crossing the small uh, river here is uh, a small lake inside the bridge. Uh, it's designed in 1972. It's in operation since 1974. There's a single span of uh, nearly 39 meters. And what we did is a visual inspection made in 2019. And, uh, briefly, the structure. So the structure consists of a steel box actually the first uh, composite box girder bridge built in Bulgaria, at least to my knowledge. Uh, and uh, there is a steel box with a constant height uh, over which uh, is cast in place a concrete deck with a variable height. All the dimensions you can get from the picture. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but uh, we have a, a road uh, uh, lanes of 4.7 meter and two pedestrian sidewalks. The shear connection at that time used was the angle profiles with some reinforcement loops. Now going to the findings of the bridge. When we first go to the park, uh, the first thing that uh, can be seen is that the pavement is not exactly the one that was uh, into the design drawings. Uh, as you can see, the payment over the bridge. Uh, 
what uh, finally was recognized that over the initial pavement, it was put an additional layer of uh, nearly the same height, thickness, which is 160 millimeters additional weight, which nearly doubles the self weight of the permanent loads from the pavement. Uh, here you can see the different layers for this new uh, pavement. This uh, actually makes the structure to deflect a little bit and now it's uh, also, you can see by visually that the structure is standing a bit of deflected due to the increased self weight of the structure. Another thing that is uh, already inside the box is that uh, actually a lot of communication was needed to be put uh, inside the box of the bridge to connect the two main buildings of the park. And uh, during they were putting these pipes and cables, as you can see, uh, a lot of things are inside the box. It was uh, decided, I don't know which who take this decision, but it was decided to cut all the vertical bracings into the box. Uh, you see here on the left hand side picture where the bracing should be initially, but now all these bracings are actually cut. Uh, this is the position of the diagonals uh, which should be there. Um, this led to uh, distortion of the formation of the cross section and reduced considerably the torsional stiffness of the boxes there at the moment there are no vertical bracings at all. Uh, if you look at the corrosion of the steel, um, the corrosion level of the steel box outside was uh, actually relatively low considering that this is the original paint maybe for 45, 47 years of exploitation. Uh, there is only zones with a pitting corrosion were found. Uh, the places where we have more uh, corrosion were the, around the dewatering pipes uh, where they were designed as a very short one and the water was actually spilling around and over the box. So we have some zones here with uh, uniform corrosion. Uh, also, we have some zones with uh, uniform corrosion around the bearings of the two, and the two abutments due to the leakage into the, into the expansion joints. The corrosion inside the box, uh, the bottom plate also is a uniform corrosion over the first fields. But uh, I have to mention that the, the water that was, uh, in, that was inside the, the box was not coming through the concrete plate, but mainly is coming through the leakage of the expansion joints. And uh, due to the longitudinal slope of the structure, it goes from field to field. So, but the first uh, fields next to the bearings were the most corroded one. Uh, both bearings are uh, movable and fixed bearing were made from steel, are made from steel. Uh, they also have a very high uh, corrosion level, again, due to the leakage of water from the joints, which actually question their functionality and load bearing capacity. If you look a little bit uh, more in detail to uh, this zone, uh, you can see uh, some lamellar, lamellar corrosion uh, of the bearing stiffener uh, where the cross section was uh, greatly reduced. Also some lamellar corrosion there is in uh, the bottom flange plate in the zone of the bearings, but also uh, as we can see here on the left hand side picture, uh, there was an impact between the steel structure and the concrete abutment wall which is visual on this picture. At the moment, the distance uh, left for expansion of the bridge is uh, not really can be considered as insufficient. The fixed bearing 
On the other side, the situation is very, very similar. So there is nothing more to say uh, here, similar to the one on the other side. Um, about the expansion joints, uh, when this new pavement was put over the bridge, uh, nobody thought of some special detailing around the joints. So the joints are actually uh, not working. There is no way to, to for dilatation of the bridge, but still the water is penetrating here and uh, you can see down all this situation around the joint. This is the cross beam exactly at the joint level, so very high corrosion rate of the longitudinal reinforcement, the spalling of concrete. Uh, so this is the condition actually uh, of, the of the concrete cross beam inside the box. Uh, on the other side, on the other joint, the situation is very, very similar, a little bit better, but still a uh, big uh, corrosion rate of the reinforcement, spalling of concrete. And as you can see or can recognize, we have also found some beds that are living inside the box. So uh, this might uh, bring us to the idea that the, the climate inside the bridge is dark and humid because of uh, these, these beds to live inside there. So similar to a cave. Uh, the corrosion of the, uh, of the concrete, let's say, the, the condition of the concrete plate. Actually, the condition of the concrete uh, plate inside uh, the box, between this, the, the webs of the box, were relatively good. There was no leakage of water, the corrosion of the reinforcement, etc. So the condition was good. But outside, uh, next to the joints, uh, as you can see on these uh, two pictures, um, near the abutments, the plate experienced decalcification due to water which finds a seepage path through micro cracks and voids. And uh, that forms mimics the shapes and forms of a cave spiral terms such as stalactites, stalagmites, and full stones. Here is where the calcium is taken out uh, from the concrete plate. Uh, some other elements were investigated as the edge beam. Uh, here, what we can see is uh, spalling of concrete, corrosion of longitudinal reinforcement insufficient concrete cover, maybe due to poor execution and uh, also due to concrete carbonation. The non-structural elements like the watering pipes and parapets, they also have a very high level of corrosion. Uh, as you can see from, from the pictures, the posts of the parapet, most of the posts of the parapet has uh, lost nearly 50% of, uh, of their cross section. Uh, actually, the, this is about the superstructure of the bridge. The, sub, the substructure of the abutments uh, were covered with uh, some granite plates, so they are not actually visible uh, the whole, but in some places, as you can see, these plates were uh, fallen down. So this was uh, a bridge that is built in uh, 47 years ago with nearly, I would say, no maintenance uh, up to now. Uh, the next two bridges are quite new, so they don't have so many uh, findings, but still it's uh, interesting to, to show them. So one of these bridges is next to the town, uh, is in the town of uh, Karbumai, which is in the um, central, south or central part in Bulgaria. So the bridge is actually an over road overpass uh, over the railway line that is crossing the town near the railway station. So this is the position uh, of this bridge. Um, So the, the, 
actually the structure is a composite continuous girder, uh, one of the first built in uh, Bulgaria. It uh, goes over the railway tracks and, and um, some side roads. The free spans are 27, 36, 27. And actually this part represents the middle part of a uh, 230-meter-long road overpass where the approaching spans are made from reinforced concrete. And the visual inspection was made in 2020 and there are just a few findings uh, but let's first go to the cross section of the bridge so it's an overpass that carries two lanes total wide of seven meter pedestrian walkways on both sides a cross section consists of two parallel steel continuous both girders with a variable height the concrete slab is cast in situ with also variable thickness. The general dimensions you can see uh, here in the figure. The vertical truss bracings we have at nine meter intervals. And the shear connection used in that case is uh, from shear stud connectors. The first finding that we recognized being in bridge are the cracks, uh, actually uh, the rainfall, rainforest concrete swap cracks are registered at internal support regions where the swap is intentions, intention. Uh, the cracks are most probably a result of the additional tension stress into it uh, in this region due to bending resulting from direct loading. Another thing is the detail where the boxes are, are connecting with the reinforced concrete approaching spans. Uh, the boxes are actually hanged on these uh, concrete beams by means of pin joint connection. Uh, here it should be noted that such hanging detail uh, is classified in the literature as a non-robust one and its condition should be inspected regularly with caution, but on the other hand, uh, inspection is hardly possible here uh, since all parts, most of the parts are not visible. And uh, as you can see here, these parts are already starting to have some rate of corrosion, but also their maintenance is uh, hardly possible. So that could be some point of interest in the future uh, to focus on. And actually the last structure, the third bridge, is a railway bridge uh, next to the town of Plovdiv uh, in Katunica village. It's on the same railway line that this overpass in Pergomai is going over. So uh, here is a railway bridge over a river, the river Chaya. So the, the position is uh, here for the bridge before the railway station of Katunica. Uh, this bridge actually um, was built in 2010. It's a continuous half through bridge spanning over the river Chaya, three spans, 30.5, 37, and 30.5 meter. And the visual inspection was made in 2020 after around 10 years of exploitation. It, uh, the cross section actually it carries a single railway track with uh, ballast, uh, two parallel steel continuous plate girders with constant height, inclined webs. Uh, the steel girders are connected to the bottom level by cross beams at a distance of around two meter. The concrete through is connected to the webs of the steel plated girders and to the top flange of the cross beams by means of shear connection shear connectors and the thickness is 22 centimeter constant of the plate. So this is a picture from below the bridge. Uh, yeah, these are actually transfers of cracks in the concrete uh, over the whole length of the concrete swap. They were reported 
right after concreting. So these cracks are formed in the early age of the concrete. They were repaired at that time. And actually what we have seen in the, these 10 years that these cracks uh, actually do not uh, propagate, which uh, can lead us to the conclusion that they are mainly due to hydration and drying shrinkage uh, of the concrete, maybe uh, maybe with an improper concrete curing during execution. Uh, also, some corrosion has started, some stains on the top flange mainly, uh, where water can be retained for longer periods. So, usually the first coating that uh, should be put uh, in factory uh, should stay more than 10 years. Uh, but uh, as we can see here, uh, this coating has already started the uh, corrosion stains and some spots. And uh, in the end, the last thing, uh, also a number of damages they are in the anti-corrosion coating were found around the welds of the transfers of stiffeners of the main girders. Uh, some of them are likely to have been realized due to fatigue of course, we cannot state this, but it seems like uh, due to the short period of operation, only 10 years, actually, if these are uh, fatty cracks, this is uh, quite disturbing. Uh, but for the actual condition, it must be clarified after more in-depth inspection of the structure. Um, but as we can see, the execution of the welding uh, here is uh, Due to visual inspection is far, far beyond the, the need of execution class three. So uh, the quality may be so, so not so good of executing the structure. And in the end, some uh, summary of and conclusions I would like to say about the composite bridges in Bulgaria. So accumulation of additional national experience related with the design and execution of steel concrete composite bridges is needed. Uh, lessons learned from each particular project has to be used in that direction. Accuracy during construction and quality control of execution also need to be higher. The site supervision companies need to control strictly the execution and the quality of works. The maintenance of all bridges should be improved and it's very important. This is obvious with the case of uh, Guiana Bridge, uh, where the bridge has not received any maintenance measures since it is brought to exploitation 47 years ago. Um, steel concrete composite bridges are one contemporary solution for medium span ranges. They are successfully implemented in a lot of European countries and worldwide. In Bulgaria, there is a need to promote their advantages amongst design engineers and bridge clients in order to increase their market share and, and implementation. So uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, th thanks, Stoyan, uh, for this nice presentation. And uh, you have shown very nice pictures, by the way. That's really perfect. Definitely all these uh, problematic areas, especially the corrosion and the, uh, the, the very last one from the uh, steel structure shows that the maintenance is very much important. Uh, and uh, so first we take some questions at the moment, uh, if there's anyone. Who wants to ask a question to Stoyan? Uh, let me see if there's any hands. Okay. Uh, so I think it's a very nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. And you have to clear Stoyan. Uh, thanks. And uh, so the next speaker. Uh, how do we do that? So, like, uh, are you going to do that? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to present in Scotland the next speaker. So, okay. Again, okay. If per you need to meet. Oh, all right, per perfect. Yeah, you can just continue then. So, thanks. Thanks. It's, uh, I have to apologize for the name of the next speaker. It's my colleague from the university. Uh, the name is uh, Azar Gurgiev. So, he's also an expert in steel and composite bridges, but unfortunately, could not join us today so i will do the next presentation as well uh, just Okay, so uh, the next presentation is more related with steel bridges and especially with a particular uh, type of deck, which is the orthotropic steel deck. And uh, one idea of strengthening with uh, ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete uh, for strengthening these bridges. So, again, the content of the presentation. So, I'll do a short introduction about the uh, bridges in Bulgaria with uh, autotropic steel deck and the problems found not only in Bulgaria but uh, worldwide for this type of bridges. Then, I will briefly show you visual inspections of two bridges with autotropic steel deck in Bulgaria. And then, uh, the laboratory test or the results from the idea that we have for strengthening this type of deck and solving the problems that I will show you uh, in the first points. And in the end, of course, I will give you a conclusions uh, about this type of strengthening procedure. So, orthotropic decks are relatively complex. Uh, constructions uh, that contain steel plates, stiffen, as you know, longitudinally and transversely with the cross girders and uh, ribs. Uh, they have one big advantage uh, in comparison with the reinforced concrete deck, which is their low self weight, uh, which actually makes them suitable for long span steel bridges and especially for movable uh, bridges. Of course, as everything in life, they have also disadvantages and maybe the one of the biggest one is their high, higher price, again, compared to the concrete deck. But considering their advantage for a relatively long, longer span than 100, 100 meter, actually, they become economically feasible solutions uh, and are used worldwide. Uh, actually, the construction, the wild, or the wide construction of the orthotropic deck started in the 60s, 70s of the last century. And uh, the bridges that are in exploitation for 30, 40 years or more uh, has shown one main problem with the orthotropic steel decks, which is uh, fatigue damage accumulation. Uh, so they have a number of complex details and crossing between elements that can lead to low fatigue strain zones. In accordance with some literature and the practice in the Netherlands, especially the fatigue cracks occur after 20, 30 years of service. And then you have to take adequate measures to restore the reliability of the bridge. What you can see actually now on this slide is the major bridges in Bulgaria with the orthotropic steel deck with some parameters. I'm not going to go into the table too much. Just would like to point this uh, column with the year of exploitation. As you can see that from eight bridges, actually seven are into the 
age of having these problems that were reported worldwide from Japan, Netherlands, France, uh, etc. So this brought us to the idea to go there and to see uh, if we have the same problems as they were reported. Uh, we have chosen two bridges, uh, the so-called Viaduct 1 and Viaduct 2 over one highway, the Helmholtz Highway. Uh, both of these bridges are built in 1986 and are now, when the visual, visual inspection was made, were in 33 years of age. Uh, so briefly going to these two structures, the Viaduct 1 is actually uh, a continuous plate girder that is having uh, six spans, 60 meter uh, the end spans, and in the middle, four span, four span 72.45 meter. And actually, this is the maximum span. The, the bridge is in a horizontal curve with uh, relatively high radius and uh, longitudinal uh, slope of 4.6%. This bridge, uh, the cross section, this bridge was actually designed initially as a composite bridge with a concrete slab on top. You can see on the left hand side picture, but uh, unfortunately due to uh, accident during execution, uh, it, was, it was built by incremental launching. So the superstructure fell down and in order to restore uh, it faster and to make it lighter, it was decided to change the concrete slab with an orthotropic uh, steel deck plate with trapezoidal uh, stiffeners. The second bridge is uh, on the same highway, very close to the, to the first one, divided two is a continuous beam uh, box girder with uh, three spans, 100, 162, and 100 meters. Again, is falling into the horizontal curve with relatively high radius, uh, 1,460 meters, and the longitudinal slope is the same. Actually, this bridge was, this bridge is uh, holding the span, span record in Bulgaria, uh, 162 meters up to, to now. And the cross section is a steel box uh, with uh, vertical bracings and uh, orthotropic steel deck. The difference here is that this uh, orthotropic steel deck is actually made from open flat stiffeners. And the first one, the stiffeners or trapezoidal closed sections. What are actually the main findings from, from the visual inspection in the viaduct one. As you can see on this slide, the misalignment between the adjacent assembly units uh, actually is very high. So they have to cut on, uh, on side these uh, splices and to produce with considerable deformations in order to uh, connect uh, the stiffeners. Uh, also, fatty crack reported uh, or found in the weld connection between uh, closed trapezoidal longitudinal stiffener and the 12 millimeter feedback plate. Uh, as you can recognize it here, this is uh, usually done due to bending in transversal direction uh, of the steel deck plate. In order to prevent such cracks, the Eurocode has changed uh, during the years, the minimum required thickness of the steel plates. So as you can see from the initial uh, Euro code, these thicknesses, the minimum thicknesses were 12 and 14 millimeter, but afterwards they, they were raised to 14 and 16 millimeter when the pavement is less than 70 millimeters. Uh, actually, here, this bridge, uh, the plate uh, was 12 millimeter. 
another thing is the connection detail between the trapezoidal longitudinal stiffener and the web of the cross beam. Here, the detail chosen is without any holes in the web. So this is, of course, this is uh, possible, but usually it is recommended that the stiffeners are continuously passing through the cutouts in the web of the crossbeam. These continuous stiffeners are allowed only for lightweight traffic, pedestrian bridges, footpaths, etc. Uh, this is due to the fact that the reduced plasticity in the cold forming trapezoidal stiffener uh, zone combined with the high tension residual stresses from the welding actually leads to very low fatigue strength detail of a category 36. Uh, just for comparison, if you make it with a continuous with a cut in the, uh, in the web of the cross beam, this detail category can be raised to 72, I believe. Also, some cracks were found in the zone of the connection uh, of the longitudinal stiffener close to the backing strip. Uh, this uh, detail actually uh, that was used here uh, differs a bit from the recommended one in the Eurocode, uh, where the backing strip should be inside the trapezoidal stiffener and the tack weld should fall into the place of the future bud weld. Uh, also, the sequence of welding in this detail is uh, very important when it's executed. In the value two, also most of the problems uh, that we recognized, uh, cracks we did not actually found, but uh, some corrosion zones. Uh, and uh, another thing that is also good to mention is that the open uh, flat stiffeners are passing continuous through the lap of the cross beam, but they are only one side welded. Uh, this was a normal practice in the time when this bridge was designed and built, but if you look at from nowadays point of view, uh, this detail is no longer uh, allowed in, in Eurocode. I mean, because of uh, the eccentric uh, load transfer and future fatigue problems. So, uh, actually, what, what we have found in just from a visual inspection that uh, the situation in Bulgaria is not very much different from what was reported in uh, Netherlands, France, and Japan, of course, due to the very uh, low, due to the lower volume of the traffic, maybe in the 80s, uh, compared to the Western European highways, our bridges look a little bit better, or at least we haven't found so many cracks. But uh, that, that shouldn't be reason to stop thinking about how we will face and solve the problem of uh, strengthening this orthotropic steel decks. So one idea that was not originally coming from Bulgaria, that was developed in France and uh, Netherlands was to reduce considerably the stresses into the orthotropic deck by addition of a layer of ultra high performance concrete that is made over the steel plate instead of the asphalt pavement. In this way, the self weight of the bridge is not changed and the stresses are considerably reduced. So we decided and initiated a research project in the University of Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy, Sofia, to check and to see uh, how this works in, in, in reality. And actually, for our, for example, we have used this uh, Viaduct 2 orthotropic uh, steel deck and uh, we have decided to produce some samples that are having the same geometry of this autotropic deck. In the research project, also some analytical checks were made as for this one-sided uh, welded stiffeners, uh, 
Fatih chat with the safe safe life concept uh, was done was performed and as you can see here this check was not fulfilled maybe this is one of the reasons this detail is no longer uh, used in uh, autotropic decks mm. also this is this is how the the specimens look like this is just the production drawing but uh, don't have to go through it uh, in detail. It's just a, a section of the autotropic deck between two cross beams, which are two meter apart and uh, 1.4 meter wide, including actually five stiffeners. So this is the segment that we have used and produced two of these uh, segments. You see here the production and decide and test them uh, once before strengthening and then after strengthening with uh, ultra high performance concrete uh, layer here on this slide is briefly the the sensors so these are the linear variable differential transducers or the so-called lvdt uh, sensors for measuring the deformations so as you can see here we have in the mid cross section uh, below the the free internal stiffeners and also at the cross beams at the supports also we measure the vertical deflection we also measure the strains with strain gouges uh, sensors in the mid cross section uh, we have uh, strain gouges uh, all over the longitudinal uh, stiffener, uh, stiffeners in x direction which is longitudinally or parallel to the axis of the stiffener but we also measure the transversal uh, strains into the steel plate uh, here with these y uh, marked sensors here and here and we also measure in the x direction with x9 and x10 also the strains in the plate in the steel plate in longitudinal direction. The steel plate was chosen 12 millimeter and the stiffeners are uh, 200 by, I believe, 12, 20. So, about the ultra high performance concrete, uh, what we can say, this was made by a original recipe of a Bulgarian producer, the, Hydrobeton. So they made uh, the recipe and also they made the, the tests for the making the, the concrete. You see here the fibers actually that were used. Uh, we have made uh, several mixtures taking uh, samples as uh, cubes and uh, beams to test it as uh, the we have also made one uh, mixing with the uh, real conditions to see the workability uh, of the concrete. Uh, so actually this is uh, how it looks closely on the surface of the ultra high performance concrete. Actually, this is a protocol from the tests of the cubes. Uh, as you can, it's in Bulgarian, so I have to apologize for this, but it's in only this column now uh, is important. So what we can see here is the, the compressive strength of the samples. Uh, we actually, here is from the one mixture, we have reached 110 uh, megapascals. Uh, and the bottom part here are, is the tension strength uh, in bending where we have reached around 10 megapascals. In reality, we had a, a little bit better than this result, which is not presented here, where we actually have reached around 125 uh, megapascals uh, cubic st uh, strength of concrete. Uh, how we made the connection? between the autotropic deck and the, 
and the concrete, the ultra high performance concrete. Of course, uh, the specimens were cleaned, as you can see, and over the surface, first uh, we have put a 0 0.2 millimeter primer, which is Sika Core HM. Uh, over this primer, uh, we have uh, applied the epoxy resin, which is the Sika Core Mastic with a two millimeter thickness. And uh, over this uh, epoxy resin, we have spread around uh, a sand, a quartz sand with uh, four to five millimeter grains size. Uh, and as you can see, the final surface uh, looks something like like this. And over this uh, surface, so we pour the ultra high performance concrete without any other shear connection. So we are using the epoxy resin to connect this uh, these stones or this sand to to the steel part, and then with this uh, uh, rough surface. Uh, is making the connection to the ultra high performance concrete. Of course, we have put some uh, reinforcement, um, normal reinforcement, and then we have poured the concrete, the ultra high performance concrete, which is uh, 50 uh, millimeters thick. As you can see, the leveling measures on the right hand side uh, for the thickness. Uh, this is how we actually made the strengthening. Of course, during the process, we have, uh, during the research project, we have developed some fine entanglement models to prove uh, the, the test setup. So this is a model, a simpler model with the shell elements, which has shown that uh, the unstrengthened elements uh, loaded with the characteristic load of uh, one single X from load models one in Eurocode actually give uh, um, stresses of around 270 megapascals, which means that uh, we expect that the, that the stiffener will yield at its bottom, even from the characteristic value. These, of course, are only uh, local local stresses from global bending of the box, uh, these stresses are not considered in our research uh, project. We also did a more sophisticated model with uh, solid elements in ANSYS, uh, where we uh, investigated also this uh, kind of uh, out of plane deformation, which is actually recognized also during the tests uh, this is on one hand due to the loading, which is a patch loading in the middle over the middle rib. So these two go aside, but also it might have some effect due to the eccentric welding of the stiffener only from one side. As we can see some bending and deformation out of, of plane. And uh, this is the test setup. Actually how we weld it, we weld it statically only. Uh, monotonically uh, with a single patch welding here in the middle over the middle rib and between the two cross beams so the, the the size of this steel plate that is redistributing the load is actually uh, 40 by 40 centimeters which is according to the load model one in the Eurocode and uh, the initial idea was to load uh, the, to the characteristic value of a single axis of 150 uh, kilonewtons, but then for the strengthened specimens, we have raised the load a little bit more. For the unstrengthened specimens, this is again the setup and the measurement in the laboratory of the university. Uh, so for the, this is a graph that is showing the force application in time. As you can see, we are applying the, the load on steps. Uh, 
uh, up to 150 kilonewtons, as you can see here, and then unloaded the specimen. So this is a statical loading only. Uh, briefly, for the results, first looking in the deformations in the mid cross section of the two, the, the, the three stiffeners, the middle three stiffeners, uh, Z2 is actually the green one in the middle. As you can see here, the, the loading of the middle one up to uh, 150 on the horizontal axis is the force. So up to 150 and then we unload it. And as you can see here, there is a residual deformation, which means that we have actually reached plasticity, uh, which uh, corresponds to our initial calculations from the finite element modeling. And actually this means that for even for characteristic load of load model one, uh, these ribs actually they reach plasticity only from local stresses. Uh, but of course here we have to say that uh, we are loading without any pavement. Uh, the pavement uh, gives a good effect or reduces the stresses. So in reality, if we consider the pavement, maybe these stresses are a bit, a bit lower but still, uh, this fact is a bit disturbing. Uh, and also the, the two side stiffeners, of course, they get, uh, they get a lower deflection, but the maximum deflection in the middle is around 3.5 millimeters that we have reached in the unstrengthened uh, specimen. Uh, when we look at this, this is the same, a graph, but showing the strengthened specimen with a ultra high performance concrete. First, you, you could recognize that we have loaded up to uh, 210. This is one of the specimens, and the other we loaded nearly to 300 uh, kilonewtons. So, if we look at 150, it's not in the end, it's somewhere here where my cursor is, and the deflection. It's actually 1.5 millimeter for the same magnitude of the load, which means that we have nearly two times more deflection due to this additional layer of, of the concrete. If we look at the strains that were measured, uh, uh, yeah, looking into the bottom part of the three stiffeners, we have X1, 2, 3, and 4 here. So maybe the interesting ones are the 2 and 3, which are the red and uh, yeah, orange, orange, let's say. So uh, this is the situation for the unstrengthened specimen. So we have reached on the vertical axis are the strains measured in micrometers per meter. So these are around 1,200. Uh, and for the same tests uh, with the strengthened specimen, as you can see, this is the specimen loaded to nearly double the force to 190. But if we look for 150, uh, we measure 500 or 600, which is again, again uh, two times more than the unstrengthened specimen. So uh, if we can summarize in, in a table here for all these uh, strains measured uh, here at the bottom, X1, 2, 3, and 4, we see that the first column is the unstrengthened specimen and the second is the strengthened one and the reduction in the uh, strains is the last one. For the middle part, middle stiffener over for which the world is over, which one we have a 53 or 61 percent reduction and even for the side ones that are not below the loading we have still around 20 percent uh, reduced strains uh, if we now look transversely what is happening into the steel plate uh, here of course we uh, are looking to why 
one and two, these two sensors, again on strengthened and strengthened specimen. And again, we reach a reduction of nearly more than 50, nearly 60 uh, percent reduction of the strain, which means also reduction of the stresses uh, of the same magnitude. And uh, yeah, in the end, of course, we have also reduction in the deflection. Uh, before I go to the conclusion and to the end of this presentation, uh, I, I have to say that, that uh, of course, the results that we get for the unstrengthened specimens uh, were without any pavement, which uh, is more adverse than the real condition of the bridge. Because pavement is anyhow reducing a bit the stresses, but still uh, the strengthening procedure shows very good results. And the conclusions, so in the, our country, there are several medium spans, uh, bridges with plate or box girder type with autotropic steel deck that are 30, 45 years of exploitation in combination with some poor detail, details and execution, occurrence of fatty crack uh, is uh, with a high level of probability in the next years. So we have to be careful and this is what is reported uh, worldwide. The provided tests, laboratory tests with uh, these segments of autotropic steel that strengthened with ultra high performance concrete layer uh, shows very good results and uh, reduction of 50-60% of the maximum normal stresses in longitudinal direction of ribs. Actually, the connection between the ultra-high performance concrete and the steel plate uh, have shown a sufficient wall bearing capacity uh, even after the elastic resistance of the ribs is reached. Uh, here I have to say that we have measured also the slip between the steel plate at the end of the segment between the steel plate and the layer of the ultra high performance concrete and actually this was nearly zero. Improvement of the composition of the mixture for the ultra high performance concrete produced in real condition is planned in order to increase the characteristic of the compressive strength and the modules of elasticity. Actually, we have reached 125 megapascals, but uh, uh, we would like to go further more, maybe to 150, uh, why not even more. Uh, strengthening of the autotropic steel decks, also for fatty crack strengthening with this type of uh, ultra high performance concrete layer instead of the pavement from asphalt connected to the steel plate has big advantages in comparison with conventional methods and a very good potential for successful in implementation in practice. Actually, a few bridges, real bridges are reported in France that are already strengthened and are in, expo in, in that way and are in exploitation for, I believe, more than five years uh, or even more. And they show a very good uh, condition now after this uh, strengthening. So um, thank you one more time uh, for your attention. And if there are some questions, yeah, you're welcome. I hope I can uh, answer those. Uh, I have one in this, uh, Stoyan, like uh, this new layer, is it also the wearing surface for the cars? Yes. Or do you apply asphalt on top? Oh, okay. So it's, it's just... It's also used for the asphalt. The, actually, this is our idea and this is how they did it in France. So they changed the normal pavement of asphalt and uh, and the waterproofing of let's say usually of 70 80 millimeters so they change it with uh, nearly the same thickness of, uh, of ultra high performance concrete which kept the self weight of the bridge the same or nearly the same and uh, due to the high density actually this uh, this material 
I don't know, somebody call concrete, some people, they call it in another way, even uh, no concrete. Uh, it's uh, very dense and uh, it's uh, waterproofed. I mean, it's not, uh, you don't have to, to take care any measures for uh, waterproofing afterwards. Of course, if we are discussing about the, if we have enough adherence with the tires, uh, we haven't done such uh, tests, uh, but uh, as I showed you the surface, I believe uh, it's uh, rough enough to ensure, but I couldn't say for sure, but I think it's enough rough to ensure uh, the moving of the cars. Okay. Uh, so it is very beneficial at the end, like uh, it is better than a asphalt because i know that for these bridges they use a different asphalt like they called uh, i don't know what they call but mastic or something like that yeah. Yeah. and now uh, you are replacing uh, two materials with one because the asphalt needs a waterproofing membrane yes and then looks very beneficial at the end yes Actually. and uh, so have you applied this one or is it on its way? Like, has it been applied to the bridge already? Yeah, in France, they have done it in a real bridge. Uh, okay. Inspected it. The, the, big, the big difference between the, the France and the Netherlands experience, where we have taken this idea, is that uh, in France, they have used for the connection a very small shear studs. Uh, okay. only 40, 50 millimeter height, and they bring, okay. they bring this ultra high performance concrete as precast elements with pockets, and they put okay. over, the, over the, the steel plate, and they filled uh, the pockets and the distance between the precast element with uh, uh, some resin to connect it. But in the nether, and this is already built and uh, inspected and in exploitation, and it shows yes. very good uh, results. They reported in the last say magazines uh, there was a, a, an article about this is a Mozart bridge uh, where they have go there ten years after being in exploitation, and the results were very good. Uh, and the Netherlands actually they don't put uh, shear studs and they pour the concrete in situ as we as we actually did it so they use some kind of adherence connection and they yes. pour the concrete in situ so there are two two main let's say directions of making the connection and and uh, the con the ultra high performance concrete concrete but uh, in both uh, the, in both research projects as well as sample bridges that were reported from these countries, uh, the results are very, very similar to what we have in Wabra. So a reduction of more than 50% of the stresses in the, in the orthotropic steel deck. So the conventional solution to strengthen are really not so effective, especially for fatigue. I mean, if you weld something or if you cut or do some holes, all these are not really effective uh, in reality, so effective as by this reduction of the stresses, especially for that. Yeah. That looks very uh, promising from what you said. Yeah, the, the, actually the, the problems or I, how I, I could say the big uh, challenges are of producing this type of material. I mean, the ultra high performance concrete as you know that uh, each producer actually has a secret uh, recipe oh, yeah. for making it and the secret technology. I mean, the major um, the recipe is uh, you can find some uh, prescriptions in the literature, but the, the real recipes they are doing it and the technology is uh, usually a secret and uh, what we tried is to see locally here what is possible, what we can do in reality, in real conditions. And uh, I think uh, for a first attempt, the results were not so bad, but 
we have maybe a, a little bit more steps to go uh, to finally reach the characteristics that we need. Well, sounds very good, Stoyan. Thanks for yeah. this nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. I don't think there's any question from the audience, but let's check. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think, th thank you. Yes, Stoyan. Yeah. Thank you as well. Yes. Um, so uh, I think the next speaker is me. I, I have just introduced myself. I am uh, Alp Janaj and I'm from Middle East Technical University. And uh, today I'm going to uh, present uh, seismic performance uh, of bridges in, uh, uh, in the recent earthquakes. Like there are three major earthquakes, Sivrija 1 and Izmir earthquakes. And uh, throughout this study, uh, we have uh, got support from the, our university, Earthquake Engineering Research Center, our university and uh, Izmir uh, municipality. And I'd like to thank them. And I'd like to also thank to uh, having this workshop for the uh, IFC Bulgarian group with us. And the thing, the thing about the seismic design is the true knowledge exists in knowing that you know not nothing. So uh, the observations uh, are something else and the theoretical values are uh, different. And today I'm, I'll try to explain uh, my observations of the recent earthquakes. But before that, uh, this is from the uh, OECD countries, like the, the maintenance spending on roads, like uh, if we check this, around, uh, there are about, I think, 25 countries. And Turkey is the last one. But when it comes to new roads, uh, Turkey is in the second line here, basically. But this has been published after this um, Morandi bridge collapse. It was the concern about the uh, Italian bridge collapse. So it was in the economist uh, region. I don't know if the Bulgari is in this group. Uh, but I don't see them, maybe uh, in a different uh, one. And when it comes to the earthquake, the earthquake is very much important. Like the red line shows uh, it is an important earthquake. And in Turkey, almost 50% of the land is an earthquake zone. And uh, we have too many fault lines. And uh, the maximum slip this North Antonian fault, which uh, goes from here to there, is uh, slip like six meters in one day, in one earthquake. And uh, the major earthquakes was in 1939. And then uh, we have new ones for sure, but uh, part of the Turkey is uh, subject to too many earthquakes. But then uh, we investigated this one, like why bridges collapse and failures happen. And most of the time, 45% of the time, it is hydraulics. When it comes to seismic activity, just 2%, this is in general uh, from the world. And uh, it is very rare that a bridge collapses uh, during a seismic event. And uh, let me go one more to this one. Oops, sorry. Um, yes. And uh, when it comes to the type, the bridge, bridge material, the reinforced concrete is uh, very common in Turkey. And then steel and stone. Uh, the bridge type collapses are beams. And most of the time, road bridges collapse or foot bridges. And historical rail bridges are very rare. Uh, to see uh, they collapse. And the trend in Turkey is going up in collapse. Like, so uh, this is our prediction. So uh, it is all about the maintenance, basically. So the maintenance is the most important thing uh, to make this happen, to avoid any type of failures. But of course, uh, for foot bridges, 
it is kind of different. Like the reason of collapse is just a collision of the vehicle. So this you cannot avoid much unless you have the proper signs and so on. So when it comes to the one earthquake, the magnitude is 7.1 and you must inspect the many bridges there. And what we have seen is uh, majority of them is uh, uh, undamaged. And there are very few cracks, so we call this minimum damage, basically. And uh, the type of the bridges there is most of the time uh, girder type of bridges with concrete uh, piers. And there are few historical bridges, like arch bridges and so on. And what we have seen is uh, the bridge wants to move. And typically in Turkey, uh, the bearings are elastomic bearings, which allow uh, movement in any direc direction. So what is holding in transverse direction is this what we call the sacrificial elements. And uh, just the girders hit to this uh, sacrificial elements and crack them. That was the only uh, thing that we have seen. And there's very little tiny crack on the sphere uh, out of 14 bridges uh, that I remember. And this one is very weird. This bridge has been uh, subject to some hydraulic event. And the reason it has been tilted is one day a tree come by, I guess, and then hit to this thing and just tilted the uh, bridge pier. But then they abandoned the bridge, but this bridge also survived the seismic event under this condition. So it is something uh, uh, that needs to be uh, uh, happening. So in reality, if you have analyzed this, we will say it's going to collapse, but like I said, uh, it, it didn't happen. And when it comes to the Sevilla earthquake, it is a 6.7. And around this area, we have uh, special bridges, like some cable stay bridges, some post tension bridges. And the cable stay bridge was under construction in Malatya. And when the earthquake happened, uh, it, it just caught at the worst scenario, like the cantilever is out, the cables are there, some of them are stressed, but uh, nothing happened to this one. The post tension bridge is, I guess, one of the first uh, post tension bridges in Turkey. And uh, other than that, it has some construction problem. During the construction, it has the sagging problem. They tried to retrofit, but also nothing happened to this bridge during the earthquake. And uh, when it comes to uh, this one, this is still bridge. And we believe that, uh, uh, oh, it's something wrong, but this bridge has been built in 1950s. And uh, it, it didn't collapse. And it was very close to the fault line. And I will come back to that one. But again, I'll go to the uh, modern bridges. And uh, this is very typical in Turkey. like. The girder bridge and then a slab on top of that. And again, the girders come by, hit to this shear key, and it stopped the moment, but the shear key just cracked. So this is very typical uh, happening in uh, a bridge seismic event in Turkey, like as a problem. And let's go back to this bridge from 1950s. Uh, it, is, it was still under service. And the bridge was not in that good condition. There are many concrete deterioration that is visible for sure. And it has been hit by flood. Uh, there are some um, material accumulated in this area uh, for sure. And uh, what happened is the bridge had a relative movement between the abutment. And you see from the top right corner, the Red line is the fault line, and this is the location. So it is only three kilometers away from the fault line. So it has all these near fault effects for sure. And we were just uh, wondered why this bridge didn't collapse. And it is from 1950s. So uh, probably there is no seismic consideration in design of this particular bridge. So uh, we look to the earthquake records and we find that uh, the displacement, the ground displacement is about uh, 15 centimeters. And the moment 
the relative movement between the uh, superstructure and the bottom is about that. So uh, what we have said to ourselves is, this is all about an uncentered abutment movement. So when the shake happens, the abutment just moved 15 centimeters with the ground and then didn't come back. And uh, other than that, like in, in this uh, time of um, computer age, we can't do anything. Like we, we fly a drone, have point cloud digital measurements. Also, we, we did conventional measurements. Uh, so it is just confirming that uh, what we observed. And of course, it was a very winter time, and this was the theme uh, that we were going there. And we were uh, spent the night together at a rural area once uh, on our travel as an observation team. And the Izmir earthquake is different. Uh, it is to the very west of Turkey. It is one of the uh, major cities in Turkey. And we, we have investigated 19 bridges there. And these bridges are approximately 70 kilometers from the earthquake epicenter. Uh, it was one of the Greek islands, I think, uh, um, if I'm not wrong, Samos or Simas. And uh, what we have observed is this, like no permanent movement has been observed in the beams and supports. The bending or shear capacity of the bridge columns and foundations has been exceeded, has not been exceeded. No cracks, no settlement, no movement, no loss of function. Uh, basically, uh, nothing happened, but the city, some of the uh, structures collapsed in the city. Also in Wana, Wan and Sivrije, there are many building structures collapsed but not bridges. And hopefully this will go through. This is just a live video from the earthquake. This is top of the bridge. Somebody uh, took a video. Uh, everybody was shaking on the bridge. And this is what we did back in Turkey, like before first, uh, seven years ago. We did a test in our lab uh, where we had the chance to shake the uh, uh, a bridge, basically. And uh, this is our lab. We have the big shaking table at that moment. And uh, we can, we know that the cars can reduce the sizing forces uh, due to the fact that they act like mist dampers. This is a uh, something not been accounted in design as well. And when it comes to the um, Izmir earthquake. The thing is this, like it was the same thing happened in Mexican earthquake. Like uh, this particular zone uh, where the arrows are, the soil is so soft. And so uh, there's a large soil amplification. And uh, when we look into our code, like we have, we have seen that the specification, the soil amplification is about 2.5 for long periods. But what has been measured for this region is uh, based on the some theory developing for Mexican earthquakes. We have seen that uh, the soil amplification there is about seven to six, which is almost uh, uh, 2.5 times than the uh, code requirements. So uh, we changed the design spectrum, the current from the specification we said uh, we are not going to use the specification one because it underestimates the design earthquake. So we come up with this uh, a higher soil amplification with a new curve and investigated these bridges again. And what happened also different is that these are twin bridges and there's no seismic gap. It is only one centimeter or so, but they never found in a, if you look into any specification, the seismic gap should be larger, like 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters, but here it is only two centimeters. Why they didn't collide is because they have the same uh, fundamental period. So no collision happened. And then uh, if the periods were different, uh, we would expect any collision. And we did a time stray analysis for this one. We take the real record and investigate and we see no collision. So the real life example has been proven, but if you're a designer, you will never 
in this uh, year of 2021, you will never go with the two centimeter seismic gap, knowing that these two structures can collide to each other and then disaster will happen for sure. But uh, luckily it didn't happen and the bridge is almost one kilometer long. So in anywhere, they never collided. And I walked through the, under the bridge, never, didn't see any sign of uh, colliding, basically. And the only thing has been uh, uh, go down, this bridge was under construction like 20 years ago. And for some uh, financial problems, the contractor left the area 20 years ago and they left the area with all these girders hanging out like this. So they are loose. And during the shake, uh, some of the girders just fell down and they were using this lot as a parking lot, so some of the cars has been crashed. Um, but luckily nobody died, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, the, the only problem with this bridges are the ACR problem uh, because of the aggregate, this alkali silica reaction. And they have some map cracking, but they didn't reduce the seismic response of the structure, basically. That's what we have seen. And we have developed a mobile system where uh, you have the location of the bridges and then you can take a note and you can just register the records or if you have a ACR problem, it can be just identified. I know that uh, after me, Mustafa Jan is going to talk about some artificial intelligence and this type of tools also can be used in uh, bridge inspection. Uh, because it's hard to train inspectors for anything. So perhaps in some parts maybe uh, we can get help from artificial intelligence for sure. So the, about not, not about earthquake design that I can say, like uh, I think the earthquake design, what we are using is uh, structural deficient. And we have also some crumbling structures for sure. And uh, it is very hard. I mean, like the maintenance, bridge maintenance is very hard. And if you have seismic activities, like we have the bridge from 1950s, it's supposed to collapse without any computation. But when we do the computation, we see that uh, there's a reason that it didn't collapse. And because it is steel and lightweight structures, like orthotropic bridges, they are very beneficial for seismic areas because they are light structures. So um, that, that I can conclude. And this is my conclusion, basically. Uh, the bridge structures almost have no seismic damage, even if some of them are in the vicinity of the fault line and most likely have no seismic design considerations. So uh, we know something about seismic design, but we don't know too much, perhaps. I mean, and the twin bridges never found them. I mean, in our specs, uh, if you go and design these bridges again, uh, we will make sure that there's enough seismic gap or something like that. But they didn't collide. I think the seismic design shall be very simple to understand and easy to apply. They shouldn't get very complex. In, in our age, uh, there are many rules has been put. And I think it some kind of diverts the engineer from reality at some point. So I think the size of design shall be very simple. And yes, this is the end of my presentation. And uh, thanks to the uh, IFC Bulgarian group again, and Stoyan. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. It was mm -hmm. quite interesting. Yes. Um, maybe I can um, question if possible. OK. Uh, when did you? So, which standard do you use in British model for the design of, of bridges? And when actually did you start to design the bridges for seismic events in Turkey? Which year is the first standard? Okay, Th that's a good question. I think in 1950s, uh, people were aware of the seismic uh, activities for sure, because there were large earthquakes in Turkey, like there was one big earthquake in 1939 in Turkey. And so they put some 
percent of letter load, let's say 5% or 10%, depending on the uh, uh, essential bridge or not. But later on, uh, the Turkish highways switched to the ESTO specifications with some modifications. And I think from 1980s to till now, uh, most of those girder bridges that you have seen, the concrete ones, have been designed uh, by the H2 specification, but with some modifications. And then re recently, uh, we have adopted a, a seismic performance or not seismic, displacement based or strain based uh, design system, uh, which is untested basically. So that, that is the problem. And every time it gets very complex, like in 1950s, Perhaps the seismic design is just only two sentences. Now, if you open any any code, like Euro code, American code, or the Turkish code, it is 100 pages of something. And then at the end, nothing changes. Like we, we just designed for 10% of the letter load. That, that, that is what our conclusion. I mean, no matter what you do, uh, if it is not like a crucial thing, uh, the design is just we divide all these forces by some R factors, and at the end, we get not much of a thing, especially in building codes. Like in Turkey, they reduce the, uh, they depend on the ductility, and they say that the ductility reduces the earthquake force by eight, eight. So instead of taking 100, we just use 15%. So if you ask me, like, that's our experience, like, uh, only the mathematical stuff has been changed. It was very simple, then now it's very complex, basically. So you're, you're mo mostly based your standards on the United States uh, standards. Not, you're not taking something from the Euro code or European codes for this uh, in, into the Turkish code. Or you have some own things that you have developed. Yeah, we have. We mainly adapt the Eshto code, not much Euro code. Like 80% of the design is Eshto. But now we have our own specification, uh, but it is some, again, uh, some version of a uh, American code, I would say. But it is, it is a unique one, like it's a Turkish one, but it has been like, uh, how do I say? It has been, uh, taken some parts from perhaps zero code, some parts from Eshto, some parts from uh, other codes, but it, it has never been tested now because it has been approved uh, this year and we don't know what's going to happen to them. We know that the bridges that has been designed from 1950s can survive and uh, the ones with uh, Eshto specification can survive, but uh, we will see. I think that the, the bridge design will get more expensive in Turkey with the new code. Looks like that. Mm -hmm. Because usually to the procedures look simpler than in Europe in general. Yes. And because one, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Stoyan. Uh, first one general remark that people that are trying to ask questions they need to be unmuted because even they want to ask question, they couldn't ask it because they are muted, I think. There are some people that write me that they, for example, Thomas Mark wants to ask something. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I'm mute, okay. It's to, in order to have the chance to ask, this is the first okay. thing. And the second thing is one more question about the bridge uh, design in earthquakes. Have you experienced this uh, so many times in literature for these girder bridges? We reported this dropping off the girders and we see a lot of pictures that girders are dropped off the piers on the abutments in Turkey. From the pictures, there is no such kind of, it's more transversal, but longitudinally the beams, have you ever experienced this type of damage? Uh... The thing is like, I think we have adapted this uh, uh, seat length, the support length. Yeah. So uh, if you have a, um, 
enough support line for the bearings, then they don't fall down. But there are bridges, like you said, with uh, very short um, support lengths. They tend to fall, but uh, and if the bridge is continuous, it doesn't fall down anyhow. The simple span says the problem, but I think if some if you see something very short, we just put an element in front. So make sure that it doesn't fall down. The only thing fall down in Turkey is uh, in 1999. So it was about 22 years ago, but uh, the fault line crossed the bridge. That is the only problem. It is not uh, uh, shaking, but it is the relative movement of the soil. Okay, thank you all. Oh, thanks. Yes, I think Thomas, you can ask me. Yeah, I only wanted to ask if you have uh, experience with uh, monitoring of these bridges, uh, if you sometimes for um, earthquake possibilities uh, measure the bridges, because we did that uh, sometimes. Uh, it, it is not common, Thomas, to monitor bridges in Turkey. And um, there are very few uh, bridges it is if it's if the bridge is a new one and it's a cable stay then people has a tendency to monitor the bridge mm -hmm. but if it's a concrete a girder concrete bridge typically they let it go and um, but uh, what we are trying to do is like uh, we will have a um, hopefully we will have a pilot study somewhere like for those Izmir bridges, and we will start the monitoring, a small monitoring system. We, everybody talks about it. I mean, we should have this monitoring system, but then when it comes to the real life, <laughs> you find nobody <laughs> in Turkey. Let Except, me know if you have the possibility. <laughs> yes, I mean, definitely. Yes. Okay, no, no, no further okay. questions. All thanks. Right. Th thanks. Uh, and if there's any question, you can back from chat for sure. Uh, okay. John, you want to talk? Yes. Thank you, John. Thanks. And I think now. Uh, Mustafa Can, you can uh, make the last presentation on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mustafa Can is a, has a PhD from Middle East Technical University and he's specialized in uh, computer engineering most uh, in his life. And uh, thanks, Can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Can, and, the, and uh, Mr. Stoyan for the very informative and nice presentations. And in the final section of this uh, today's event, I will be talking about some uh, information or details on the AI driven bridge inspection and maintenance systems, but it will be more concentrated on the inspection and much less on the uh, maintenance parts. So as uh, Professor Janner has mentioned, I am Mustafa Jan uh, Yücel. I have completed my PhD in 2016 uh, on online earthquake risk assessment systems for uh, reinforced concrete buildings in the civil engineering department. But I'm working in uh, the software development field since 2012. And I have experience in a variety of platforms that includes the Windows systems and web systems and mobile systems using different tools and languages, of course, which depends on the need and the uh, requirements of the particular project. and. For the recent years, I've been working in the machine learning domain, specifically uh, artificial neural networks and the convolutional neural networks using uh, the common tools such as the TensorFlow and the PyTorch. And today, in today's presentation, I'll start on the bridge inspection concept. So what is a bridge inspection and why do we perform bridge inspections? And what is a bridge inspection is, as has been demonstrated in the previous presentations, it is uh, assessing the condition of a bridge use, uh, by monitoring or uh, considering individual elements and coming up with an overall grade, which represents the current status of the bridge. 
and in terms of why do we do these inspections there are the, there are mainly four major sections you might say not types but reasons first of them is the reactive one which is an inspection done when has something has happened this could be an event for example it could be an earthquake it could be a component getting damaged by an accident or something like that so react you react to an event basically after it happens second one is the periodic or scheduled maintenance it happens on predefined uh, periods of time so that you can follow up the bridge these time span changes from country to country and code to code like it could be six uh, months it could be several years it also depends on the detail or detail of the inspection that has been done periodically it is as i said this is usually called a scheduled or periodic pay inspection there is also a proactive in, uh, inspection types where you uh, where you try to eliminate defects at an early stage for example in a in any type of periodic inspection you realize that one component has issues but it's not in a threatening situation yet then you monitor or inspect that component more frequently than the others so you try to eliminate that defect at an rather early stage where it is present but it does not affect the structure completely yet and finally there is the predictive uh, inspection types which use analytics or structural analysis or finite element kind of analysis where you analyze the structure and on the computer for example you realize that some things might be in trouble or there might be some issues with several components so basically you predict that there might be issues there could be potential problems and then based on this prediction you perform your inspections so besides the reactive one the other uh, three are usually considered as preventive or preventative maintenance and it's kind of an important topic because with the help of these uh, inspection types you can reduce uh, the effect of any damage before it becomes too severe like before you can basically replace any component while it's still in under uh, early stage of a defect rather than replacing maybe the whole bridge or very large chunks of it at a time due to the uh, damage, progressing damage. So how do we do these bridge inspections? Basically, in terms of the utilization or implementation, there are uh, three major branches. The most common is the cursory or walk down or eye inspections. In this uh, types, usually a team or some person, some in one or a team of inspectors goes to the site and then usually without any instrumentation they uh, inspect the bridge with the naked eye You're using their experience some uh, guidelines and specifications and they assign grades to the uh, individual components or the target component and they might utilize some very minor tools such as rulers or uh, some other measurement tools but usually not uh, uh, usually some more advanced tools are not utilized. The second uh, group is called the instrumented inspection. In this case, you usually go with a specific measurement type in mind. For example, it could be forces in cables. This could be uh, the strain in structural elements. This could be the stresses under in structural elements or anything like that. And you go to the site with the uh, with these instruments that will measure the target parameters and then you make your measurements and then you analyze your data based on the uh, data <clears throat> based on the data you collected during the inspection and finally we have the continuous inspections which is more commonly refer referred as structural health monitoring or uh, health moni uh, structural monitoring in which you deploy these sensors or measurement instruments, measuring instruments to the structure full time. And then they continuously make measurements and record these into using the data acquisition devices. And most of the time they have remote connectivity capability. So you can just download the data in real time. You can follow the data in real time. But as it has been stated in the previous presentation, this presentations, this is usually uh, quite expensive because the equipment are uh, high grade so 
so they can perform on site conditions. So they're expensive. The sensors are usually expensive, but it is the only, in a manner of speaking, the only type of inspection that can give you a, a real time assessment on the structure uh, 724. So first, I uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the common problems in the walk down or eye inspections. And one of them is the decision of the grading system scale. And by grading system scale, what I mean is that, as I said, you give each component a grade based on how good and how bad it is. And you can give a grade like between zero and three. For example, you can say zero is really good, no damage. Three is really bad, it has a lot of damage. Uh, but uh, this approach has some drawbacks. It has some advantages. For example, you know that uh, a, a component with a grade of one is worse than a component with grade of zero. So the distinction between uh, delineating variations of uh, grades like zero, one, and two is quite clear. You know that if a component is one, it has clear degradations compared to a component with a grade of zero. So it is a good thing. But the bad thing is that you have really low number of divisions to uh, account for or to symbolize the level of degradation. For example, you might have two components. One of them is a little bit worse than the other, but still it's not as bad as like, you don't want to give them a grade of two to both of them because you know that they're not as bad, but you want to distinguish the two components, but you cannot give them zero or one to the other because it's not in that good shape. So you have a little bit of less uh, number of divisions to represent the actual case on the paper or like in the inspection report. So it's kind of an issue. Of course, on the other end of the spectrum, you might have a high number of divisions. For example, you can grade the structure from zero to a hundred. So now you have a hundred uh, grades to use. And, uh, but now in this case, the high number of divisions is again a double-edged sword because now you can easily compare different uh, components in between, like between each other. For example, you clearly know that a component with a grade is with a grade of 80 is better or worse than a component with a grade of 70. Like comparing uh, individual components in between them is now quite easy. But now the problem becomes distinguishing the different grades. Like, let's say you are the one who is reading an inspection report and you get two components on the report. One of them has a grade of 70 and the other has a grade of 75. So like on a hundred of scale, on a scale of 100, they have only five difference between them. And usually, especially if the inspection team is not the same, like different people are grading, which we will come uh, in a second, the grades will vary somewhat. So it becomes really hard to distinguish uh, the difference between similar grades, like the grades in a close proximity or the neighboring values. And of course, this is basically uh, has roots in the fact that eye inspection base is based on a human factor. First off, it being the experience. Like, of course, every engineer will have the basic knowledge to about the bridges and structural behavior and other things. But usually it requires quite a bit of experience to distinguish patterns from the individual dots as seen in the figure, which is the knowledge. and Basically, the more experience your team have, of course, the more accurate inspection results you get. But the problem is, it's really not easy to uh, come up with a lot of experienced uh, inspectors, especially if your country has a big, in, uh, big inventory or stock of bridges. Like if you have thousands of bridges to inspect, then obviously you cannot create 2000 teams of five highly experienced engineers. So they have to basically prioritize and in which case you become, uh, you experience issues based on the human experience levels. And the second problem with the human factor is again, the subjectivity. As you can see uh, on the figure in on the right, the, even though the reality is objective, like in case of tree or in case of a bridge, you you everybody sees the same picture or same reality objectively. Their interpretation will be subjected to their experience levels, uh, their decisions, and even their mood. Like when we say subjectivity, it doesn't necessarily mean subjectivity between uh, different people. 
even uh, like even in the within the same person or even considering the same person an inspector's decisions will you does usually change based on his mood like he might have some health problems he might be hungry he might be tired or he might have some family problems or social problems so all of these parts play a major role most of the time in uh, the decision of the inspector or the grade final grade of the inspector which results in uh, uh, predicting the value or not value but predicting the actual case from a, an inspection report quite hard like the authorities obviously only get the inspection reports which has uh, grades and notes on them but they have to analyze the structure based on these grades they have acquired and if the grades are not uh, really uniform and objective in themselves then it becomes harder to actualize the reality in a correct manner and another common problem is the speed and the efficiency of the uh, speed and the efficiency of the inspection process itself as i said especially if you have high number of bridges uh, if your bridge inventory is really hard uh, really large it becomes quite hard to come up with a scheme that can uh, basically encompass or contain every bridge in a reasonable amount of time so usually what happens is the inspection teams just prioritize bridges based on their previous conditions or some other factors and then they go to them one by one which is really not very efficient in terms of speed and accurate not accuracy but in terms of speed and efficiency as i said so it becomes slow and also usually when a relatively inexperienced team goes for an inspection they have to uh, go back and forth between their manuals inspection manuals between the references specifications and other guidelines and tools which also slows down the inspection process itself uh, in a team because they continuously have to basically uh, apply to these kind of documentation and manuals moreover uh, it's also a problem for bridges in uh, either discrete uh, like remote locations where transportation is really not easy or for the bridges where the where accessibility to individual components is not easy for example if a, if a relatively long bridge is on top of a river then you really need specialized equipment to go under the bridge or if it is something be, uh, connecting between connecting uh, like a bit mountains on a deep valley you again need specialized equipment to reach for the high parts like the pylons for example tops of top of the pylons or the bottom parts where uh, or like the piers and starting sections of the piers. So accessibility and uh, is also a major issue in the case of bridge inspections. So after stating some of the common problems, I want to talk a little bit about the artificial intelligence and deep learning. I'm not going to get into too much mathematical details, but you might have, you might have realized artificial intelligence is a term that is now widely or very commonly used in all parts of our lives. Like our cameras now have AI, which enhances camera quality. Some uh, furniture have AI, so they can basically infer the inputs and outputs. But basically what artificial intelligence is actually uh, is a system that can learn from experience and improve itself based on this experience in a like if you, if you want to define the artificial intelligence as an umbrella term, it can be defined like that. Uh, what we use in engineering applications is most like most of the time deep learning. We, deep learning is considered a subset of artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning most of the time. Uh, it, these are not new topics, obviously. They are uh, they're on the literature since 1970s and 80s, but they have uh, gained an acceleration in 90, late 90s and early 2000s. And recently, some uh, people decided that actually, like, uh, artificial intelligence is not a broad umbrella, but it is. it has some intersecting sections with deep learning and machine learning and things like that. But basically, what we utilize in most of the time are is called the deep learning or machine learning. And if what it is, is basically you have a number of input parameters 
and you have a number of output parameters that you want to deduce from these input parameters. And in between you have a number of hidden uh, components. This is why these networks are most of the time called deep learning because on, in between the input and output layers, you have deep hidden layers which are connected to each other and you usually don't see them in action. So what you have is basically a black box that you give some input and you get some output. And uh, now these hidden layers, uh, hidden uh, circles or layers, they are usually consist of hidden, uh, sorry, neurons, which like they are obviously named neurons because they are kind of based on biological systems. The whole concept of artificial intelligence and deep learning is actually kind of mimicking the nature, mimicking the biological processes in computer science. So uh, these are called, the individual processing units are called neurons. And most of the time in simple artificial neural networks, ANNs, these are nothing but activation functions or simple functions. Like you can see two sample on the right. These are uh, like uh, rectified le leaky unit or the name doesn't matter, but these are basically just simple input output functions. For example, this neuron, if he gets a value of zero, it gives zero, it gets some value of one, it returns 0 0.5. So this is kind of something very simple, but in the recent years, especially with the advancements in hardware, we have some really complicated, complicated uh, neurons as well. For example, the, the one in the bottom is uh, uh, called an uh, uh, LSTM, a long short term memory unit. It is, this is technically still a single unit, a neuron, but it's actually a kind of a layer in itself. It is a neuron that is composed of multiple neurons or multiple units, activation units in a manner of speaking. And these are commonly used in language processing, um, time history processing, such as uh, the stock market analysis and some other things where the context is important. Like if you have a long data, if the first data has some impact on the next ones, then you usually try uh, to go with these parts of things. Now for the types of this deep learning uh, uh, types, let's say, uh, the types of the deep learning are many obviously, but what the two commonly used one are the supervised and unsupervised learning types. Like in the supervised learning type, you have, you already have an input and you already have an output. So, and then you train your network with, by giving this input and output, for example, uh, you have the input parameters. It could, in terms of inspection, for example, let's say you have some measurements that has been done and you can already, you already know if this measurement is this value, like it's less than 10, then it is bad. So you give the network that the input parameters and their corresponding results, and it can learn from this. And this is called the supervised learning where you supply and samples data set. In unsupervised learning, you have the inputs, but you don't have the output. So you want the uh, artificial intelligence itself to draw up some conclusions. And obviously this cannot have, uh, this kind of uh, learning that cannot have calculations in the supervised learning case, but more like, but moreover, uh, but more likely what it does is uh, basically clustering the input. Like it can group your input parameters into different uh, sections. For example, it can say that these five of them are kind of close to each other. So I think these are a group and it can say these 10 of these are kind of similar. So I think these are a group. So basically it gives you the groups or clusters of the input data. Uh, of course, these are the types of learning, but in, but in order to use the learning, you need a kind of a model, which is basically the relations or the uh, mechanism that does these calculations that learns and there are very again a variety of different model types which like decision trees uh, regression analysis support vector machines but the most common ones uh, are artificial neural networks or shortly ANNs which deal with again the input and the output parameters and as it has also a subtype which is called the convolutional neural networks which, speci which specializes in uh, image processing. So now we know we have some idea on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we can ask what can be determined like in an inspection, for example. And basically you can determine cracks, excessive uh, deformations, scouring uh, using these 
types, you can basically determine the presence of anything that manifests itself in as a visual clue. Like you can see the cracks, then it can be determined. You can see, for example, excessive deformations. Most of, if you can see, then uh, you can determine the presence of them. You can obviously see efflorescence or alkali silica reactions or any other things. And these are also detectable by, by uh, convolutional neural networks. So as I said, uh, I'm going to more focus focus more on the inspection part. So especially the eye inspection part. So we will I will try to explain a little bit more on the convolutional neural networks. And the detail of the convolutional neural network is really not that important, but what it does is uh, it can do several things. For example, it can work on object identification and classification. As you can see, the object, the classification is basically uh, assigning a picture a class. For example, you see here a picture of cat and it can be classified as cat. Uh, so different types of uh, character like handwriting recognitions and other things work based on this principle basically. So in this case, you usually have a single object on the image and you classify it. More advancedly, you can have object detection and localization. And in that case, not only you find the object, but also you determine the location of it in the picture. And in this case, you can actually have more than one object. Like as seen on the third picture, you can have a, a variety of classes or objects like cats, dogs, dogs, and it can identify each of them separately in a single picture. And it can also uh, predict their, not predict, but calculate their locations on the picture as well. We also have image segmentation, which uh, divides the picture onto these classes so that you can see the boundaries of these cases. For example, if you have a scouring, if you have corrosion, or if you have spalling, and you want to calculate the area of this defect, for example, then you need something like image segmentation so that you can basically isolate the area in a numerical or quantized manner. Finally, it has, uh, CNNs can work on style transfer, but it's not very common in uh, engineering practices. So the convolutional neural networks used to be multi-pass, which means that they had to look to the same picture again and again and again so that they can determine the objects on the first pass, the types on the second pass, their location on the third pass. So they were very slow and they were not very accurate to be fair, but the contemporary approaches are almost always single pass. Like you, the, the neural network just looks at the image once and it determines everything that it needs, it needs to. And therefore they are quite fast. They are quite uh, high in accuracy, but they're also quite high, high in architectural complexity. So this requires to have somewhat more powerful devices and it's really not easy to meddle with things. So it requires more expertise in a manner of speaking. And some of these contemporary uh, models that are used in CNN are YOLO, which is an acronym for like you only look once. Uh, I think it's on the version five now. And we also have SSD, which is single shot uh, detection. And like these are really complex networks. They have around 100 to 100 to 150 layers, uh, each interconnected uh, in different ways, but they work quite well actually. So basically how does machine learning or deep learning help in inspection cases? Well, first of all, it basically reduces the subjectivity. As you might recall, the reason of subjectivity is mainly because different people uh, rate different, uh, different people rate different bridges. So you, ensuring unanimity and uniformity is not that easy. And secondly, the same person might have different moods. So it will also affect the outcome. But if you use an artificial uh, machine learning model, then it's basically an cons artificial construct. So it doesn't have like any mood, it doesn't have any other thing. So it works on the same level. It works on the same objectivity all the time. So you don't have basically any issue with that. What I like, it can, what I mean is that when you have a report, when you have two reports, let's say, or a single report with different component grades, if all of them are, uh, let's say, graded with the same artificial intelligence, then you know that basically, if they are 70 in terms of grade, then they are kind of equal. 
so you have much less spread in terms of the uh, grades. And also they have increased speed and efficiency because well, basically they're of course blazing fast, like they, you can work them in real time with the camera feed of your Android device so they can work in real time. Uh, they are they increase the speed also uh, because you can deploy multiple teams with a little bit less experience, for example, to multiple locations and they can all work at the same time. So basically you can have more field teams because it becomes kind of cheaper in a manner of speaking, like both in terms of money and uh, time to uh, create inspection teams. They're also kind of more efficient because uh, they don't, they usually have, not usual, but they have the experience hard coded in themselves so they so they don't need to refer to specifications guidelines uh, or technical help documents they just work as they are they also decrease the necessity for experience in the inspection teams uh, as i said like they don't necessarily decrease the experience in a manner of speaking but they shift the experience from the inspector uh, to the artificial intelligence so that uh, even though even if your inspector is not as experienced as it, he needs to be, you have the artificial intelligence backing him up with the collective experience so that you can basically have uh, less experienced teams which have more in num which are more in number. <clears throat> they can also extract some minor details because after some time the inspectors can get tired or when there is a major issue, for example, there is this structural component which is clearly damaged most of the time that component takes the focus during the inspection and some other things might be overseen because everybody every inspector is basically concentrating with all their uh, might to that topic so the other things sometimes are not seen or overlooked so the artificial intelligence doesn't have these kind of issues so when they look at it they extract everything in detail basically uh of course, artificial, we said a lot of good things on that, but artificial intelligence is not like basically far from perfect. It has several problems. For example, it requires an adequate training set size. Like you cannot train a network using five, 10, 100 images. You can obviously, but uh, if you need high accuracy, like in the range of 95%, 97%, you usually need thousands, not hundreds of thousands of images. And there are, you need to apply special techniques to those images. So it requires both uh, collecting them and processing them, which takes quite a bit of time. Secondly, as I said, the contemporary models are quite complicated in uh, their structure or architecture. So if you want to deal with them, you have to have some knowledge in mathematics and programming, especially in the development stages. Obviously you don't need them in the using stage or the service stage, but you have to have them uh, these knowledge in the development stages. And also it also requires an initial time and money investment. As I said, you have to gather expert teams, you have to collect pictures, you have to have some time to train the network and implement it in a usable field application, for example. So it requires some initial time and money investment. Obviously these investments are not as large as, let's say building up an expert team of thousand people, but nonetheless, it's still some additional cost. And also they obviously do not uh, eliminate the requirement of expert verification. Like in the end, they have their confidence intervals and good results, but uh, somebody has to verify this. Of course, the number of expert teams that need to verify the results is really low compared to sending teams to the expert teams to the field, but still you will need to implement a means to you, uh, apply this uh, expert verification. So basically, uh, I want to show some things about uh, I, these cases. We uh, basically, I work in a company, a research and development company called BridgeWiz. We uh, specialize in bridge uh, uh, construction design consultancy and uh, use of software in these cases, in these domains, basically. Uh, so we're working on an inspection tool, which is under development, so it can, uh, 
uh, find different uh, defects in a structure during an inspection. This could be alkyl silica reaction. This could be a fluorescence. This could be some other case of uh, deformation or problem. Uh, this could be corrosion. We have a separate uh, corrosion detection tool. Actually, this tool is in the market uh, the Play Store, Google Play Store. I think it's free. It should be free at least. Um, so basically, this can this application can detect the presence of corrosion, which can, which is which can be very obvious in this case or not that obvious, for example. And it has quite good accuracy in terms of uh, verification. Now you might ask, why would I want to use an AI tool on a picture like this? Like it is clearly obvious that this has corrosion, but of course you might. Uh, there are two cases, of course, uh, or there are two things that you should consider first. Not, not, not all these cases are this obvious. It might be very minor case It might that can be overlooked or uh, it could be something in a remote location. So if you can only go up here with a, a remote drone, something like that, then you can use this tool in a drone, for example, which supports the Android operating system and you can send it basically to remote, uh, to inaccessible locations and it can list the problems on the that it finds out based on the pictures or the live video feed that it captures uh, secondly these tools these are really good tools for automation for example you can have a static camera looking at a bridge if it's in a city for example and it can continuously monitor using these tools and if it sees the uh, occurrence of something such as corrosion it can automatically create a report, something like a PDF report, and it can send it to all the authorities or the owners or anybody who is responsible. This can this camera doesn't need to be static. Actually, you can program drones to follow up a path. Like you can use this in a pipeline, for example. You can program two or several drones to follow up uh, several GPS coordinates every day, and they can just do these trips. They can perform these calculations on the fly while they are even flying. And when they see a problem, they can just create a report with the GPS coordinate, uh, with the pictures, with some other information, and they can just post that report to anywhere again. So uh, these tools are very useful in terms of those cases as well. This is an, uh, this is an application that is used in, uh, I think, real estate, for example. It's for buildings, obviously. Uh, in the image, you can see it uh, lists the problems that it finds on a colonial or a building. So it can identify the vegetation, it can identify the color changes, it can identify either the spallings or some other problems on the bricks, for example, and you can have a report on this immediately. This is another sample this, uh, I, for building inspection and restoration. So it can, again, identify the spot bricks and cracked bricks. So you can either just a single or a few drone passes or video captures, you can come up with a comprehensive report, inspection report, which details all the problems encountered basically. So as a summary, again, use of artificial intelligence uh, in inspections is quite fast and efficient and uh, rather accurate in terms of false positives and false negatives and also the precision of it. But again, it requires investments in the short term and it has some other issues that need to be solved with by uh, people that has knowledge in it. Um, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any other any questions or comments, I'll be happy to answer or address them. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, John, for the presentation. Uh, yes, I have one question. <laughs> hey, sure. Uh, do you also um, uh, have you also the possibility for measuring uh, uh, higher frequencies in dynamic movements? Uh, most of the time, by picture only, no, because. Uh, especially in ambient vibrations, though the amplitude of these vibrations is so low that it's usually impossible to capture them with camera only, obviously, but uh, not with these kind of networks, but uh, some other types of networks, you can actually process 
accelerometer, like acceleration data, if you have accelerometers or other kind of uh, movement sensors in the field, you can use artificial intelligence to process that data for basically some other calculations. It could be damping uh, calculations. It could be uh, any change, like the, trying to detect any change in acceleration response based on e uh, recordings of the past year, for example. So you need some other specialized tools for that because most of the time images only is not very helpful in identifying those, uh, you know, very minor uh, vibrations in acceleration. Okay, acceleration. Uh, I ask this because we have a camera system now which can increase the vibrations so that you can actually, mm -hmm. in the picture, um, let's say, yeah, increase the, the value, I don't know, 10, 100 mm -hmm. times that you can see the movement and also mm -hmm. get the amplitude. So maybe yeah. this, this is possible in the future. Yeah. Most likely, most likely. I mean, if the, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, if you're trying to, for example, measure vibrations under heavy loads, like if the vibration is kind of uh, not visible to the eye, but visible to the sensors, then of course, like if it's under a test track, for example, or a test train, which weights like, tens, not hundreds of tons. Well, it is possible, but ambient vibration is usually in the range of like a uh, hundred or tens of millimeters. So if you do, uh, there are special LED, uh, infrared LEDs or some other cases, like you can still put them on the bridge. And if you put your camera really close to it, it might be possible, but usually those minor movements are uh, not except, uh, are not registered on the sensor of the cameras because they don't have that much of precision at some distance. If you're very close with that specialized tools, it might still be possible nowadays, but in the future, I'm pretty sure, yes, that will be possible too. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe I can ask one question. Of course. Uh, is it possible that uh, with the system you control the geometry of a certain bridge, let's say, and you can recognize deflection uh, measuring in two points in time, let's say now and after 10 years, mm -hmm. so that you can see some problem, maybe this is some a sign of a problem if you can recognize the change in the, in the geometry? Uh Actually, yes, that is possible. That is, I mean, considering uh, putting the neural networks aside, that is also one of the, as far as I know, ways to assess uh, damage, like change in deflections or other things. But with these systems, of course, you can do that. But one thing to consider is that 10 years is like a quite a long time. So basically, these two pictures that you are comparing has to be taken from the same location. So you, the camera movement should be not excessive at least because uh, the, you, you usually measure the deformations with respect to the camera because that's your only reference. If you, don't ha if you have any fixed point of reference on the bridge, then sure, but usually you don't have, I think, as far as I know. So you make these measurements with respect to the camera. And if the camera moves around, then comparing them might be not easy. Like if you have a static camera mounted, let's say on the top of a building, then sure, but then of course you have to distinguish if the camera itself has moved, like if the building has moved or the camera post has moved or the bridge has moved because they're not, because it's relative basically. But it is possible to put up a less uh, marker, let's say on the ground near the bridge and you can make all your measurements with respect to that marker, which you assume that doesn't move. So it will work, yeah. You can also, by uh, not, it's not a deflection, but in terms of geometry changes, you can also identify the presence of or the loss of items. For example, if you lose a if you lose a railing, then it will not be uh, visible, obviously, on the image. You can identify these kind of things. Uh, if you have like an element that, like a pipe, kind of something that is broken and just moved around, so it's. You can also identify these kind of things, but for the deflection comparison, as I said, you need to be kind of careful to 
consider the relative moment of everything. But it is possible, yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Uh, I think, uh, th thanks a lot for attending uh, uh, this workshop. And hopefully we will make this face-to-face -face at some point. That's our mission. And uh, indeed, the uh, IFC Bulgaria group has started this one in November. I, I remember it is Bridge Nights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you invited me. And um, uh, typically we have this event in May. And uh, But now it's June. And next time... Uh, Hopefully we'll, we will make it face to face at some point. We will decide on that. We, do, we really don't know exactly what's going to happen at winter time for sure. I know many conferences uh, go back to online system, even if they are uh, supposed to be face to face. But my expectation is in 2022, uh, it will be at least face to face at some point. That's my guess, but I'm not the expert on this for sure. So it's hard to tell, but we have an event in 2022 in August in Istanbul, a, a bridge conference. So we can work this one together for sure. Yeah, yeah. thank you for, for this invitation. But also one possibility is that we can make it on the site visit in Turkey Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, we can plan all these trips for sure. And I know a uh, couple of people from Turkey, uh, contractors are working in Bulgaria and they drive back and forth. I see that there's no problem in crossing countries, borders. So uh, the only thing is still, uh, it can be arranged, I guess. I, I'm not so sure of the rules, but perhaps it is not bad. I, I didn't investigate, to tell the truth. We will learn and uh, perhaps we can uh, organize a field trip somewhere in Turkey, for sure, yes. Why not? It's yeah, possible. Maybe we can see the Chanakkale Bridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we will, we will, we will arrange something then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you definitely. very much for the perfect organization on the oh, thanks. all national group. But thank you very much. And we really hope uh, that the next time it's possible to be face to face and uh, just to consider the, the today workshop as the first step of our future cooperation. Thank you very much. And oh, another th th uh, speaker. Well, thank you for the interesting presentations. Thank you. Th thank you. Well, ha have a very good day and uh, we keep in touch for sure. And uh, yes, I'll talk to you. Yes. Bye. -bye. And, uh, bye. John, also, you will make this at YouTube, am I right? Yes. Uh, you will put the, uh, uh, the uh, workshop mm -hmm. at YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And then we will send you the link for all the audience and yes. okay. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.